Good morning, everyone. I'm Alejandra Magana, Corporate Partnerships Manager for U.S. Soccer. And I'm Amy Hopfinger, Director of Events for U.S. Soccer. On behalf of everyone at U.S. Soccer, we're so excited to welcome you to Nike's New York headquarters in the second annual She Believes Summit presented by Deloitte. We have an amazing group of women here today from all across the country, so thank you all for traveling and spending the special day with us. Today is all about you. We want you to get involved, ask questions, challenge yourself, and challenge us. So thank you for being here, and very quickly, we want to get started, get our voices warmed up and ready for the day. So on the count of three, I need everyone to shout out where they're here from. Got it? All right, one, two, three. I don't understand any of it, but great. <laughs> that was great. Now, in case you missed it, last weekend, our women's national team wore the name of their heroes on the back of their jerseys. They took She Believes to a whole other level. The names ran the gamut from RBG to Beyonce to Mia Hamm. As we get started today, we want to know what your jersey name is. Who inspires you? So one more time, um, I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it, a couple seconds to think about it, um, and then we'll shout them out. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Right. More Mia Hams. All right. <laughs> nice. I love it. Uh, so the She Believes movement started in the run-up to the 2015 World Cup. Our fans at games did what we affectionately call the I Believe chant. Our women's national team heard that and felt inspired. And in the run-up to 2015, a new mantra was born, She Believes. She Believes is about empowering women and girls to be confident, be inspired, and to achieve great things. We're so proud of the She Believes movement and what it's come to mean for so many women and girls. Today, She Believes is more than just a mantra. It's it's a movement that includes a world-class soccer tournament featuring some of the best athletes in the world. The She Believes Hero Competition that honors young girls who are heroes in everyday life, the internship program, this summit, and soon to be rolled out, a professional workshop series. This movement continues to grow and we're excited to have de partnered with Deloitte as a foundational sponsor of She Believes. So thank you Deloitte and welcome. Okay, very quickly, before we get started, I would be remiss to not thank a few, um, take a moment to recognize some women from U.S. Soccer who make She Believes possible. Um, not only do they live it every day, but they were able to deliver the event that you're at today. So um, if you see any of the U.S. Soccer employees today, please tell them thank you. Um, feel free to give them feedback, comments, questions. Um, we'd love to hear it. Okay, enough from us. Let's get started. So we have a great lineup of trailblazers here. Um, and to, to kick us off, I'd like to introduce you to FIFA Women's World Cup veteran, two-time Olympic gold medalist. During last summer's 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia, she made English language television history as the first woman to call a men's World Cup. She'll, lead, she'll be the lead game analyst this summer for the FIFA Women's World Cup in France on Fox. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to our host for today, Ali Wagner. Thank you, lady. Thanks, Amy and Alejandra. I think you forgot the most important one, though. Mom of triplets. And another little girl. Morning, guys. How are you guys doing? Really? How are you doing? OK, much better. Uh, I'm honored to be here today and really take you through, I think, what's going to prove to be an empowering and enlightening journey. There, we're going to go through a lineup that we have set forth. But I think it's uh, only fitting that we're coming together the day after Women's International Day. And that's a day that was set up really to celebrate the women we are. But I think perhaps more importantly, the people we can be as we learn to coalesce our female community and take each other to places that we never even dreamed of at this point. Um, I also want to tell you how proud I am of you guys. Give yourself a pat on the back. Because each and every one of you, yeah, come on, do it. It's early, I know. Actually, you guys are all East Coasters, more than likely. I'm the West Coaster. It's early for me, not you. I'm incredibly proud of you because you guys are showing that you have a strong commitment to furthering, who, furthering the person that you want to be, taking responsibility for trying to grasp onto tools that are going to help you guys achieve your dreams. So I'm really proud of you. Congratulations on that. You've already taken the first step. In fact, Part of, this to, part of today, uh, one of the things we're going to focus on is community and really learning to network. And I want you guys to turn to each other and congratulate each other. Introduce yourself. 
Turn to each other. <laughs> Don't fake it both ways. You got people all around you. Okay, that's enough. We're not in school. That's enough. Was that a little bit uncomfortable for you? You guys seem really amazing, actually. If that was me at your age, I would have been uncomfortable. And I think one of the greatest things that I had learned was you've got to put yourself in uncomfortable situations because that's when you know you're going to grow. That's when you know you're going to push on to do big things. And you guys are going to find, and you're going to hear from all the speakers, that's going to be a resounding theme, is get yourself uncomfortable. Put yourself out there. Put yourself in positions to achieve. I know you guys will. All right, let's move on. We're going to get to the good stuff. We've got a top-notch a top lineup of extraordinary women across multiple disciplines here today to share their incredible stories, their careers, and professional trajectories. And I assure you, each one will inspire you. Each will have messages for you. And if you really listen, and it seems like you guys actually do, so I think we're starting off strong, and you absorb and through their stories, you are going to learn how to equip yourself with tools to accomplish whatever aspirations are brewing in your heart whatever's going on in that mind of yours. All the panelists have faced challenges, professional, personal, and you will too. But these women have all managed to push through them and achieve their visions and dreams. The goal today is to help you achieve yours through their stories. Before we begin, let me give you a quick breakdown of the day's activities. We're gonna start off by hearing from our keynote speaker, Safra Katz. She's the Chief Executive Officer at Oracle Corporation and a female leader in the technology industry. Following the keynote, we'll have our first breakout session. If you don't know what it is, you're gonna be divided into smaller groups which will allow you to engage more, and please do so. Use these opportunities to question, to speak up, and even feel a bit of trepidation. Again, that's a tool that you're gonna take forward with you. We will then hear from our Breaking Barrier panelists. These pioneers have truly paved the way for other women and have competed at the highest levels in their respective sports and industries. They will lend their insights on how to build strong female communities and continue to lift others along the way. Finally, we will conclude the day learning from two influential women who created their own pathway to success, one of which you might know a bit about, World Cup winning co head coach Jill Ellis, and the one tasked with leading the number one FIFA ranked team this summer in France to pull off an unprecedented back-to-back -back championship campaign. The other, Jennifer Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer at Deloitte, who has a tremendous passion for advocating women's health. Sound good? Aren't you guys glad you said yes and signed up for this? <laughs> Me too. All right, we're going to get started, and we are coming in hot. Ranked as one of Forbes' most powerful women of 2018, Safra Katz, the Chief Executive Officer of Oracle Company and a member of the company's board of directors. And because that's not enough, she is on the faculty at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and currently serves on the board of directors of the Walt Disney Company. Safra is a champion of industry leveraging technology to make an impact in the world of business and beyond. Among many things, Safra also helps bring technology to schools that lack access in the realm of education through her seat as chair of board of directors of the Oracle Found Education Foundation. Excuse me. So everyone, please welcome Safra Katz. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And wow, it's just great to look out at such a wonderful group of women. It is, it's really a privilege to be in front of you all. So thank you. And thank you, US Soccer, for inviting me and our partners, Deloitte. So this is really a, a great day for me. Um, I was actually asked to share the unlikely route that got me here today. And uh, you know, many of you will kind of think back on this when you're giving your own big speeches. And you'll probably reflect back on the routes you took to get here. So let me tell you mine, and you'll see how unlikely it was. I was born in Israel, and I came to the United States with my parents and my little sister, who, by the way, is back there. Um, and we moved, I was, uh, I was five 
and she was nearly three, but not three, as I remember reminding her. And I started first grade, and I did not speak a word of English. And in fact, I was so nervous when dad took me to school that I got sick right in front of my classroom. And I mean it, I mean, I threw up right there. Way to make a first impression, okay? And uh, went through devotion school, Brookline High School, public high school, had a few choices of where to go to college. Got a number of possibilities and probably instead of doing the obvious choice, I picked the school I went to visit that I thought was most fun, okay? And that was in fact the University of Pennsylvania. And um, that was a great school, absolutely fantastic. Now, I will tell you though, that I ultimately ended up graduating the Wharton School of Business, which is an undergraduate school. But when I applied, I'd never even heard of business school or the Wharton School. But I transferred in my first year because it didn't have a language requirement, okay? Way to go. And uh, I think they've changed that, by the way. But that was a great school. And then I went to law school. And in fact, it was such a great school. My sister followed me there, and now my nephew's there. And uh, I went to law school thinking I was going to be a lawyer. My uncle was a lawyer, and I thought, that's what you do. And all of a sudden, since I was at law school, a number of investment banks came to interview. And I'd gone to Wharton undergrad. I was a lawyer. It was the 80s. It was very cool back then, ask your parents. And uh, I went to Wall Street, very, very atypical. And there I showed up. And I have to give kudos to my firm. It's a firm that's been acquired many times over now, and it's part of Credit Suisse First Boston. But my firm hired as many women as men in the investment banking class. And they really tried. But you know what? I don't know if we were so ready for it. Because I can tell you, the way I showed up for work every day for many years until I was managing director probably, or maybe a vice president. I showed up in one of those blue pinstripe suits, skirt suits, white shirt, or pink shirt, or blue shirt, with one of these little ties, because we wanted to look exactly like the men, as much as possible. And yet, even though we were trying to fit in, I myself, when I was at Penn, actually not only studied business, but studied computers. And just so that you, you probably can't even imagine, but the computers we worked on in those days were so big they'd need to be in a room like this. And we worked on either punch cards punch cards, really, that we held together with elastic bands, and we did only in the middle of the night, because that's the only time you could actually get to use them, or terminals where big pieces of paper would come from the floor and be on top, and we would type into these buttons that, that were, in fact, buttons you pushed to, to program. Okay, so I get to Wall Street, I do a couple of leverage buyouts, and I say to myself, you know, you know what I think's gonna be really big? That stuff I worked on in college, these computers, that's gonna be a big thing. And kudos to my firm, again, and my mentor, Tom Gregg, just the greatest guy. He took a chance, he took a chance on me. I thought software was going to be big. We had what was called the software analyst down in our research department. And I partnered with him. And they sent me to California to go build a business. I'm not sure they thought I'd ever come back successful. 
But they gave me, they let me buy one of these $2,400 things called a cellular phone, okay? It was this big. You wore it like a purse. You, and that's where I, how I worked. I flew to California. I had my office, otherwise known as my phone. I had a laptop that was so heavy, you'd have to check it in luggage now, okay? That's how big it was. And that's how I worked. Now, it's not clear that making that kind of a uh, career move was the obvious choice. Once again, I did this thing that they said, go, let's let her do whatever she wants. She's going to be a pain otherwise. Good thinking. More advice coming on that front. Okay, now just so that you know, one of the very first deals, actually it was the second software deal I ever worked on, was this little company called Oracle. It was a database company, maybe had a couple hundred million dollars in revenue. In fact, nearly went bankrupt in 1990, but in those days that was the second deal I ever worked on. And working on that deal and meeting Larry Ellison really at the very end of that deal is probably why I'm now at Oracle after all these years. Now, just FYI, I was an investment banker for nearly 14 years. And as far as managing directors who went from associate to managing director, I was the only woman in my group that made it all the way through. So it was hard. Now, I'll tell you though, a lot of people made other choices. Some raised families, but a very large group of them now run their own funds, their own groups, and many of my and many of the women that worked under me are now uh, very, very well known. Not the least of which is Sally Krawcheck, who some of you may know came from Citibank and now runs a woman-oriented hedge fund. So let me just tell you a little bit about Oracle because outside of Oracle Arena and probably the America's Cup, uh, America's Cup sailing, you probably don't even know who we are. So let me just tell you a little teeny bit. We are about 40 billion in revenues now and we build the underlying software from nearly everything you see and do. Your ATM card wouldn't work without the Oracle database back at J.P. Morgan Chase or Citi. You wouldn't be able to make a phone call because it's in the Oracle databases in some of the largest, most secure systems in the world that all the phone numbers on the planet is held. Your GPS wouldn't work because that's what's up in all those satellites. And in fact, pretty much your iPhone would be a paperweight because it's our systems and technology in collaboration, of course, with Apple that allows so many things like iTunes and iCloud and, as I said, your phone, Mac email, that's us. So, um, and we're pretty, kind of, we're very unknown and we don't mind it that way. Our people spend their time solving the hardest, most complicated, problems in the world, and I've got 140,000 of them doing that. And as I probably just mentioned, we spend $5 billion a year on R&D. And currently with those 130 plus thousand, we hire about 14 people every day of every week, of every month, of every year. We're hiring probably 14 today. So, that's who we are. Now, as I mentioned, to get here in front of all of you, I made a lot of very strange choices. Probably not the obvious choice, not always for the obvious reason, but I think my job here today 
is to give you a little bit of advice that maybe I would have used and could have used, and at the very least, I probably would have done the same thing, but nonetheless, I would have thought about it a little more carefully and maybe understood it. So some of the opportunities that are open to you right now and that you should take advantage of is any time you see change, change. You see, to be, to be really successful, you must see change almost like oxygen. You must go for it. You must see it and not be afraid of it, but grab it and view it as an opportunity to do something differently. You need to be thinking, how do I make things better? How do I buck the status quo? I mean, look, there are three kinds of people. That's what I've noticed. There are folks who lead and change constantly. Every opportunity they want in and they're, you know, put up your hand. Who wants to run it? Me. Who wants to do this? Me. Whatever it is, they're the ones, they see there's an opportunity. Of course, you don't want to be obnoxious about it, but nonetheless, you want to try. Now, there are folks who, once they see it, they're going to go with, and they're going to even make it better. That's that second group. And then there's the group in the back that are so terrified or don't want any part of change. And when you go to them, they're like, nope, that's not how we do things. That's not, that's not, nope, 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 that's not how we did it last year, and I don't want to change this year. Okay, I will tell you. First group, excellent. Second group, excellent. Third group, don't want to be any of those. I'm pretty sure none of you are that third group. And the question is, first or second, where you are in all that. I will tell you that my own management team, which is dominated by women, are in group one. In fact, being their manager, which I'm barely, being their manager is the easiest job on the planet because every single time they walk into me and they say to me, this next budget year, I'm gonna do more and spend less. And every single year, I don't have to say, hey, listen, can we do a little better? Can we, nope. They are so self-directed, self-motivated, they make me look good. Because every single time, they're doing more, they're changing, they're adopting, and they're spending less to do it. And that's releasing more and more resources for us to continue to invest in innovation. Okay, now, I have to, I've lost myself because I'm talking to you instead of reading, so, all right. I think I'm here. All right, as you guys know, my path was technology. However, is technology really different? Is it like one of those where that only applies in technology things change? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that all fields are open to innovation right now. Things are changing all the time. I mean. There was a time there was no Uber, there was no Airbnb, there, there was definitely no Waze, there was nothing. All of these different things, you had maps, there was no, you read newspapers, you went to hotels only, you got a taxi, none of it. Now, innovation and new ideas are everywhere, and so, it's very, very important to understand that whatever you're interested in, there are new things happening and change, and you want to be on the forefront of that. Now, I will tell you where I really learned to understand this, and that is my, my other great mentor and friend and uh, boss for many, many years, and that's Larry Ellison. And many of you probably know who he is. He's the founder and chairman and chief technology officer of Oracle. And people who know him, you know, people who see him in action, sometimes ask me, so Safra, how is it to work with someone who thinks out of the box? I have a secret to tell you. Larry doesn't even see the box. He sees how things should be without 
all the constraints of how they've always been done. And I try every day in working with him, which I do work with him every day, in trying to make sure that I don't get too comfortable in my box. You know, being a lawyer, you kind of walk, you live in a box, there are a lot of rules. I fully furnished my box. And the whole idea is, whoa, think about problems that you want to solve without thinking about how it's always been done. And that is the kind of genius that I, you know, that I see in him and that I, I'm continuing to work on and I, I really implore you to step back and think about when you're solving a problem. Now, it is also true that sometimes doing something differently doesn't work out as I'd hoped. Yeah, okay, it's not personal. Okay, this didn't work out, all right? Next problem, next idea, next thing to do. You've gotta just shake it off and move on. I'm sure many of you have had little disappointments, big disappointments over the years. You know what, have faith. Have faith in yourself. Have faith in your teammates, your colleagues, your classmates, your family. Get up, do it again. The only way you know that this failure is not, is not forever is after you've got your next success. And that's what you've got to consider doing. Now, of course people say to me, Safra, it's easy for you, you've got power. You've got power at Oracle, you're, you're CEO. Basically, whatever you say, say go. Okay, first of all, not so, not really so, because that's not how you lead. You, you don't lead by telling people what to do. You lead by showing them the way and letting them go forward. And by the way, I got no power at home, okay, zero. All right, just if they did what I asked, but that's for another meeting. All right, so let me tell you who's got real power with me at Oracle. The people that get things done. The folks who never let things fall through the cracks. The folks who show up on time, actually early, okay? Those folks, they've got power with me because when I ask for something or I have an idea, they go try it out, they make it better. I've got folks who work for me who I, who I can tell you are better than me in their field. And I collect those people. The way I've ended up where I am is by making sure everyone around me is fantastic. In fact, way better than me. So that's what, that's the way you have power. Now, what I would like to do over the next 10 minutes or so is talk to you a little bit about sort of my top 10 lessons over the years. And you don't have to write them down or anything. And I've shared those uh, before in different contexts. But let me tell you what I always go back to. And I think at least some of them may hit a note for you that might be valuable later. So my rule number one, and I guarantee you don't have to write this down, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, okay? Now, I know you'd think that that is incredibly obvious, but how many times have you been somewhere where there's a PowerPoint in front of you and all the colors and all the words and the, all the boxes fit together, and then if you take two seconds to really think about what's being said, they're making no sense, okay? And no one in the room wants to be anything other than a dog watching television, so then they'll just go on to the next slide. Okay, rule one, raise your hand right then, go. I'm really sorry here. You know, you just basically said a unicorn flew over the moon here, and it makes no sense because no one's seen one, and I'm pretty sure going over the moon is definitely not in the plan. And when you point, you just ask, can you explain it again to me? How did this happen? I can tell you I've been in a lot of meetings where an entire slide deck has been prepared, dozens of pages, and on page three, I've asked 
one question like, well, how would the customer feel about this? Or is this going to make our employees happier? Or it's going to get give them concern? Or technically, explain to me technically how those two products are going to work. Because I know the technology. I'm pretty sure those two things are not going to work together. Whole meeting closes up. We're on slide three. They go, you know, hmm, interesting question. We'll get back to you. Meeting over. That's going to happen to you. Don't be the dog watching television. If it's not making sense, I guarantee it. In the room, it's not making sense to anybody else who's listening. Listen. Don't sit back. Make it better. OK. Now second, don't stand still. OK. What does that mean? It means make decisions. I cannot tell you how much time is spent in meetings and in classes, in the, in, and especially when you get to business or academia, when you have situations where a whole bunch of people are talking in circles. You came into the meeting, circle, you get out of the meeting, the circle, no decisions made. Their only decision is let's have another meeting. Bad idea. Let's make a decision, OK? Make decisions quickly. Indecision is a major, major enemy to success. Because what happens is everyone around you, especially if they're dependent on your decision, you waste so much time during this indecision period, you can't recover. If you make a mistake early, you've got time to fix it. If you've wasted all your time, too late. Indecision really is the enemy. OK. Now third, OK. Not only don't stand still, this is going to sound contrary, but it really shouldn't be, which is don't chase fashion. And what I mean by that is, listen, you want to be fashionable? Go shopping. No, no. What I mean by that is execute your strategy. Of course, take in as much information about the decisions that you want to make. But if all of a sudden there's a new cool thing and it's not making sense to you, don't chase it, OK? It's going to, just because they're coining a new term, it may not be a good fit for you. It might, and then that's one thing. But if it really isn't you, don't chase fashion. Don't be this thing you're not. Keep your discipline. Now, additionally, when I say stick to your core, execute your plan, as discipline's critical. And I have an addition to this one, and I'll really go into it in detail in a, later on. But just because everyone's telling you to do something, do something, sometimes doing nothing, deciding actively, I'm going to do nothing is harder than anything. Just because people are pushing you, do something, do something. And by the way, because they want you to do something, anything. Sometimes doing nothing at all makes sense. And that, for example, includes getting into a big Twitter fight for no reason whatsoever. Sometimes this ain't your fight. Just step back, stay out of it, move on, execute your strategy. Fourth. Style matters. And again, once again, I don't mean fashion. I mean your own personal style of communicating. Be you. And I know that's a new term, but I wrote this many years before that was an idea. What I mean by this is be authentic. It's often terrible. And I, as I said, I think back on showing up on Wall Street with my tie and my blue suit trying to look like basically a man in those days so they wouldn't notice, OK? And, and let me tell you, not only are good ideas important, but how you convey them. Convey them with sincerity you really feel. And don't convey messages you don't feel. Be and be true to your ideas. Think about who you are. And sure, we can all have a little polish on how we say things. Clearly, I can, could use some more. But nonetheless, 
Use your own voice in your own messages. Don't be someone else. Don't pretend, okay? Fifth, if you don't ask, you don't get, all right? Now, you'd think I don't have to say this again, but I'm gonna. If you don't ask, you don't get. And that's not only true in sales and in negotiations. I can't tell you how many meetings I've sat in where we're arguing and negotiating amongst ourselves. The other side's in a totally different place or in a different room. And we say, oh, they'll never agree to that. They'd never, oh yeah, let's not ask that. They'll never, okay, let me guarantee how you will never get that. If you don't ask for it, you will not get it full out. So don't ask, don't get, don't negotiate with yourself. I tell my own staff, please, team, whoa, we're going to know when we ask for it, not a minute before that. Okay, now, sixth, and this one kind of goes back on that Twitter point, and this is probably going to sound a little counterintuitive coming from a technology person, but just because everything can be put online, doesn't mean everything should be put online. I know many of you are working on your messaging and how to do, and then all of a sudden, you know, somehow on social media, there's the most ridiculous thing on there. That is gonna be there forever. You can delete it, trust me, it's still there. Everyone's got, just be, think about everything you put online as you. Is this you? Is this really you? Is this the you you want people looking at and thinking about? Is this really? Or are you just in a bad mood, being really silly? Don't think about it before you do it. Sometimes just take a step back, take a breath, and say, you know what? No. Okay. Now, on a related note, and I hope I don't offend anyone here, but no doubt I will, um, the press is not your friend, okay? The press has a job to do. They have a job to do. Promoting your personal agenda is not actually their job. And there are going to be times where it feels like it and your interests are aligned. But believe me, and especially when you get old like where I am, you are basically, you know, you're one story away from a bad headline. So remember. They're not your friend, unless they really are your friend from college, and then in which case, then they're not press. But they're not your friend. They're doing a job just like you're doing a job. Eighth, let me say a little, probably won't, now it's getting really important for you. I'm going to say a word about integrity. I'll tell you a little story. A number of years ago, one of my colleagues, one of my direct reports actually now, was in a big fight in Sacramento, California. That's the, that is the capital of California, Sacramento. And he was brought in to be questioned about some contract, something. It was really more than anything else, it was an opportunity for a bunch of politicians to embarrass a bunch of executives. And top guy said to him right then, are you stupid or a liar? And he goes, I take stupid. Right answer, and I'll tell you why. Because everyone makes mistakes. Everyone makes stupid mistakes. I'm sure I'm gonna make one today. This fashion choice might have been one of them, but nonetheless, you, you make stupid mistakes, you can recover from them. If you're a liar, you lose your integrity. It's unrecoverable. It's not coming back. So when you, find yourself in one of those embarrassing, stupid situations, go, yep, yeah, it's on me, stupid, right here. All right, on nine, you've got to have humility. The truth is, the reason I'm standing here and I got to be in front of you and got this great privilege is, I'll tell you right out of the box, is attributable, attributable mostly to the luck of being born to my parents. Both of them Holocaust survivors, worked hard, spent time with us, helping me on my homework, taking me to ballet, doing whatever I needed to do, and me and my sister devoted their time and their lives 
to us, okay? Wouldn't be here without them, that's for darn sure. Now, everyone in this room is smart. Every one of you is an overachiever. There's no question, you just wouldn't even be here. But the difference between those that are successful over the long, long term and those that are not are those that understand that this is, all of this is often related to not only the incredible hard work you do, but some luck, some real luck. And when you find yourself being so lucky, and that includes the genes that are passed down to you and all that, when you find yourself in that lucky position and you find yourself where I am, use your power for good. Use your power for good. Because let me tell you what we're doing at Oracle. As, as was mentioned, I'm chairman of the Education Foundation at Oracle. And you know what we did? We decided we were gonna change the luck of a whole hundreds of students in San Mateo County, which is our county in California. And we built the first public high school on a corporate campus. It's called DTech High School. It is free. It is open to anyone in California with an advantage if you are in San Mateo County. No advantage if you're an Oracle employee, though. And we not only built the most uh, forward-looking, environmentally sound high school, we built it right on our corporate campus on San Francisco Bay. We made San Francisco Bay better because we built that school. We write curriculum. The first parts of the curriculum we wrote was called wearables. And this was a girl-only high school class for girls who had no experience in technology at all. And it matched programming, which they'd never done before, and fashion. And they built the most incredible pieces of technology, whether they were helping their blind grandmothers tell between a $5 and a $1 and a $10 bill. Yes, these young ladies that had never programmed before got to do things like that. But not only that, this course was so popular that the boys wanted in. So we now have so many pieces of curriculum. We've got girl only, we've got mixed, and now, of course, we've written all of the more advanced courses. But just let me tell you, I mean, if we hadn't decided to use our power for good like that, the kids would not have graduated. The kids who physically designed that high school with our architects graduated their, this past year, their first year. So, we're now in year five, public high school. And finally, finally, whether it's in business or in school or in teams or in clubs, the bottom line is success is a team sport. And the guy who has the assist is just as important as the gal that scores. And that's just the way it is. And there's, and I know for sure that in my case, lead, leaders are only as good as their whole team of employees. And in my case, it's over 130,000, 14 of them today. And uh, so I guess what I'm telling you, and I'm sure you probably concluded, is are basically things you already know, which is, our work is not over. Successful women, while more common, are often still the exception, not the rule necessarily. But today, it's still hard. But some days, you make a little bit of progress. And it's the events like this that you've all put your time, and US Soccer, and Deloitte, and uh, Nike have sponsored here today. It's events like this that remind us that we're all in this together. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.